are going to delve into the role of uh, research, development, and innovation collaboration yeah. uh, in transforming South Africa's socio socioeconomic uh, economic landscape. Uh, we've heard from the previous panels um, the importance of investing in business uh, R&D and, uh, and the key challenges and opportunities in specific sectors. Um, but they have also told us that it's not only about the, man the magnitude uh, of investment in R&D, it's, al it's also about how this R&DI takes place uh, and uh, that plays a very important role in the outcomes, uh, who, si who sits at the table. Um, uh, a, pre a previous uh, question uh, from the floor was how do we encourage cross-sectoral sector, cross collaboration in R&D to foster socioeconomic development in South Africa? So I think this is the question that we'll be addressing in this panel and will we'll allow us to dig a little bit deeper uh, into this question of partnerships and, and collaborations. There are huge opportunities in collaboration uh, and we'll explore how these synergies can be identified and built and supported. Um, but also, we heard that, that, that collaboration is easier said than done. Um, in the previous panels, they told us some of the, the, the challenges uh, in, in specific sectors, uh, in terms of managing uncertainties and risks, um, different perception of timelines, IP issues, even power uh, dynamics, underlying tensions, mistrust. All of these are issues that could pose uh, challenges to, to collaboration. Um, so let's try and get some concrete ideas uh, on how some of these difficulties could be overcome. Uh, what types of incentives uh, could be put in place to make this collaboration more prevalent in the system? Uh, we have a fantastic set of panelists uh, from very different organizations uh, representing perspectives that speak to these cross-sectoral uh, issues. Issues of labor, uh, climate change, the mobilization of finance, policy, um, and, and there's a wealth of knowledge here. So we have five panelists uh, uh, here, and uh, we will be alerted if, if up. And we have a, a six panelists online. Um, uh, so we will start with those that are uh, here uh, present. And uh, we have been alerted that we should try and keep this panel as close to an hour as possible. Um, and we are quite a number of people, so I'll ask you to keep the interventions to five, six minutes, six minutes maximum, if possible. Uh, please don't be offended if I stick my head out and sort of signal yeah, that you need to wrap up. <laughs> yes. um, I would like to uh, ask just the same question to everybody. If you can touch on uh, um, uh, these two points. One is why is R&D collaboration so relevant and yet so difficult? in the particular um, sort of uh, cross-cutting issue that you, that you work on. And the second one is this call for action. Um, what incentives can be put in place to ensure that uh, RDI collaboration is more prevalent and sort of concrete actions that, that or examples that you have in your space mm -hmm. that can inspire broader uh, collaboration in other, in other spaces, societies. Okay, I'll start with... Um, uh, Dr. Crispin uh, Olver, sorry, brief introduction here. Uh, Dr. Dr. Olver is uh, the executive director of the Presidential Climate uh, Commission, which is an in independent uh, multi-stakeholder advisory body established by the President of the Republic. Good, thank you. And a uh, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, as you heard, I, I run the Presidential Climate Commission, and uh, in many ways, it's already a collaboration. So, it's, it's a body the President appointed in 2020. We bring together science organizations, business organizations, trade unions, civil society activists, NGOs, and government ministers. And uh, our job is to plot the pathway to net zero by, you know, we, we know we need to get there by about mid-century, a little bit later for developing countries, a little bit earlier for developed countries. Um, and at the same time, we want to build climate resilience. And when we talk about the climate transition, we're really talking about three interrelated transitions. So the one is the reduction of emissions over time in the economy to get to this net zero point. The second is what we call adaptation, which is 
building the resilience of the country and people and our economy to the physical effects of climate change, and particularly extreme weather events, water security, food security, infrastructure resilience. And then there's a third very important component that we subscribe to in South Africa, which is what we refer to as the just transition, which is about making sure that the risks and opportunities in this transition are equitably shared. So bringing that into a technology space, um, a figure that's often touted, uh, we've got about 70% of the emission reductions that we're going to have to make we've already got mature technologies for. So these are technologies that have been proven, they've been widely adopted, uh, prices for those technologies are coming down rapidly. But there's a very important 30% where technologies are either not yet developed or they're not yet at a sufficiently mature level. Um, and R&D obviously plays a fundamentally important role in all of this. So it's been driving a lot of the systemic change. Uh, you've seen solar PV prices drop by 88% over the last decade. You've seen onshore wind prices drop by 67%. So, you know, these are big changes and it's leading, it's now, you know, we've now crossed the threshold where low carbon technologies in combination with storage and peaking power are now the cheapest solution to energy, energy gem generation problems. Um, and they're cheaper than any of the other archetypes that we have in the mix. Um, the gap, so you know, South Africa does comparatively well in terms of its climate sciences. Uh, uh, you, we've seen RDI spend sort of flat line in South Africa. But if you look at the environmental sector, it's, uh, in Glenda's report, uh, it's the one sector that's growing. It's in fact grown three times in real terms over the decade. So we're doing well. We've got an activity index for the climate sciences of 2.6, which uh, means that if you look at our aggregate RDI spend and you benchmark it against other countries' spends across the different sectors, we're doing 2.6 times better than most other countries are doing. And that's because we've got some really good climate science capacity, particularly in the atmospheric sciences. You're seeing a little bit of the usual suspects performing. So, you know, UCT, a lot of outputs, WITS, UKZN. We do need to be broadening the base in terms of our R&D activities, particularly in the university. So we want to see a much wider spectrum of universities uh, playing a significant role in this transition. But our big problem is converting the RDI into innovation, into commercially viable initiatives. And it's that conversion where, you know, to come back to your partnerships question, that's where we really need to be putting a lot more effort. And I've been, you know, uh, following what a number of other countries are doing. And a lot of them are now investing in what they call net zero technology centers. So these are centers that are driving investment in a wide range of technologies. They're they're in fact technology agnostic. So, you know, I know a lot of the environmentalists don't like carbon capture and storage. Personally, I think we're going to need carbon capture and storage at some point in our energy transition. So I would, you know, follow an approach that says let a thousand flowers bloom, pursue all of the technology that we're going to need. Some of it will succeed, some of it won't succeed. But, you know, I wouldn't be ideological about particular which parts of the system are going to succeed. But the core to these successful net zero technology centers is what they refer to as the triple helix model. So that is bringing the academic community into dialogue with the business community, into dialogue with the government regulators. And I don't want to cut out any other stakeholders. I mean, I think a lot of these initiatives also need other stakeholders at the table. But, you know, for South Africa, I'd like to see us pursuing 
a network of net zero technology centers embedded at our universities, but equally with a strong foot in the private sector and with strong collaboration from government regulators that intervene strategically to take these technologies to scale. Great. That was, um, that was a very concrete suggestion for, for an action that could be taken up, um, the, uh, the network of uh, net zero technology centers embedded in universities. I would like to look to um, our universities and turn to, um, to Dr. Uh, Petiwe Matutu, um, who is the CEO of uh, University of South Africa, to, um, to give your reflections on... Oh. Uh, thank you very mic. much. Okay, great. Yeah. And uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. And uh, the first one is to congratulate the HSRC on this milestone of uh, the 20 years of uh, producing um, this booklet. We relied on it heavily uh, to get our investments in science, technology, innovation increased as a country. Um, there were times where we would have some kind of foresighting as uh, part of the Department of science and innovation when I was still there as a consequence of this monitoring. So it has been a very, very useful and important uh, for the science sector and the university sector as well. Um, on the questions of uh, potential collaborations, I do think that uh, the level of detail that one has to put in, into the collaborations is very important. Um, it has been repeatedly mentioned here that uh, um, when we talk innovation, we're not only talking uh, PhDs and so on. So as the university sector, which focuses largely on skills development and uh, human capacity development for the country, um, the way in which those students do get trained uh, is quite critical. The, the technical knowledge and the know-how is no longer sufficient these days. One has to look at the broader training of students in such a way that they work on real-life problems and they work on uh, uh, um, institutions where they solve problems and they are part of big projects. And if you look at RDI, uh, there's a role for undergraduate students within RDI in terms of the training of those students. Uh, there's a role uh, for the higher education in terms of the training of those students, the mobility of staff between the private sector and the universities in such a way that uh, the technologies that we're talking about, which are constantly changing, within the private sector. These academics are familiar with those technologies and are able to see and provide the necessary training for the students. So um, I'm just, as, 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 as University of South Africa, we are focused on the work integrated learning. And when it gets to postgraduate level, uh, you can hear people talking about uh, research innovation, uh, RDI integrated within teaching and learning. So that issue is a critical one if you are going to get the graduates that you are looking at, which are going to uh, work well with the industry. We know in South Africa that We've got so many students who, for instance, cannot be placed within the private sector uh, due to the shortage of opportunities just to get their qualifications completed. So for me, I do think that the nature of the partnership uh, between the higher education and the private sector is, is, is very important. They are organized through organizations like ourselves. Uh, the Work Integrated Learning, they've got an association, 
Uh, they are supposed to be interacting with key sectors. There's representation in key sectors. And sometimes if there are problems, uh, some of those organized uh, groups do come to us to check exactly who out of the Work Integrated uh, 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 Learning uh, Association can be a representative in this uh, group. So um, that is quite cru crucial, and even at postgraduate level, to come up with that kind of training which uh, doesn't have any form of a, a work based kind of interaction is, is just not, 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 not useful. So uh, that is the level of uh, um, collaboration which is required with these associations from our side. The technology transfer uh, officers have requested to be part of our communities of practice within the uh, uh, University of South Africa. They want to organize themselves. They realize that if they don't come together, organize is the training on their part and uh, elevating their issues uh, to government or to uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, um, university vice chancellors who constitute the board of University of South Africa is not going to happen. And the institutionalization of their work is not going to be helpful. So um, that talks to the graduates which we produce. It talks to uh, the people who are key in uh, facilitating, be it their training or facilitating uh, the activities of industry within uh, uh, the universities. And then the second aspect on um, RDI, the actual activities that we're talking about here in research, development, innovation, there is a bias of higher education institution where they focus largely on research. And that is emanating from the fact that uh, the majority of them see this whole thing of training of a graduate within a particular um, area as the main aspect of their work. And then uh, applied uh, research is supposed to be coming from that, and the innovations are, are supposed to be coming from that. And the key issue right now, it has been highlighted a number of times here. Um, I think the person who was in mining did mention that the first question is, what do we want to innovate on? Or what do we want to use research for? Is the key question. So the interaction where there's co-creation of research project, where there's co-creation of uh, the innovation priorities, is quite important. And you find out that there are universities which would go to industry and call industry and say, bring all your problems. We are going to be trying to resolve them over this period of time. That helps a lot in creating the relationship between uh, the private sector and uh, uh, universities with the understanding that the human capacity is there. And slowly moving to the infrastructure component of things, it's important that industry invests in this infrastructure and it does get shared among universities. So without that investment by industry, we rely on government and we are aware of the shrinking resources of government. And for a sector that is trying to be as inclusive as possible, where about 70% of our students are being funded through NSFAS, you'll find out that those resources are diminishing because you get restrictions in terms of the cap in accommodation, cap in tuition, cap in this, because government is trying to afford this 70% of, uh, of, of the fees that they have to pay to universities. And similarly, with the reduction of the income which is coming through the block grants or the income which is coming through the infrastructure grants. So we understand that there's no way in which the public sector is going to manage what we require. We understand that private sector cannot invest 
in higher education without public sector firstly investing in it. Okay. Then okay. coming to the international. Sorry, uh, I have to, I'll have to ask you. Oh, to sorry. Okay. <laughs> to wrap up, you can you can make the point very oh, very that's short. Fine. Coming <laughs> to the international collaborations, the new issue that we are looking at is that one of networks of universities where we interact with other networks of universities in other countries. What we're trying to do there is to get maximum impact out of working together. Coming up with themes where all the universities will crowd into that with the hope that they will quickly come to uh, the global solutions that we require. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Very, very important points. You talked, you talked a lot about, you highlighted the um, importance of that relationship, partnership between uh, higher education institutions and private sector. Mm -hmm. You also talked about the importance of institutionalizing some of those relationships and mm -hmm. partnerships uh, to make sure that they happen more systematically, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I would like to turn uh, on to private sector um, and uh, ask uh, Shamila, uh, the CEO of the National Business Initiative, which is an independent uh, coalition of the local and multinational businesses um, taking action to achieve local and uh, social and environmental sustainability, to make a re to respond. And it would be great if the panelists can respond on uh, the proposals made. Uh, uh, what's the feasibility uh, of some of these concrete uh, proposals that have been made? Thank you, um, and thanks for inviting me. It's also good to see the diversity in this panel. I'll have a dig at Cass's previous one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I thought the diversity was fine. <laughs> <laughs> he would. Um, but thank you so much. And uh, so, you know, in, in response initially, I think I'm going to just cover a little bit about what we've seen as the National Business Initiative. It's a slightly different organization in that it's a voluntary organization of businesses who really want to be leading in sustainability, sustainable thinking, but directly contributing to the social transformation in the country. And so it's not a mandated business organization. Uh, and that comes with its challenges, but it sits at a very interesting intersection of business and philanthropy, which I think is an important one, because in that form already is innovation in being able to bring together different sources of funding um, to leverage that, you know, and one could already call, for example, our membership fees uh, a, a, a bit of a private sector funding. Mm -hmm. So we then crowd that in, uh, crowd in using that tr to crowd in a lot of uh, overseas development assistance and donor funding and being able to leverage that to expand the projects. And at its base, what it was trying to do, what it trying to do is collaborative action for systemic change. And that sounds like a lot because it really is. But the areas that we focus on are on, in the, on environment sustainability. And so what Dr. Olver mentioned earlier on is very much in the trajectory of what we're looking at, um, has produced research work where there was multi-stakeholder collaboration work. And that is one of the areas that we're looking at at innovation. So when Dr. Olver talked about the net zero um, research center, was it? I think that is something that one could certainly look at, but I would also challenge that that is about, at the same time, considering what the technology needs are, what the economic development needs would be to support and sustain that, but very importantly, the skills development needs. And I think that brings together a number of the sectors that are present in the room today and in the conversation. The skills of the future are not going to be the ones that we've had up to now. We have a certain base that we're going to use, but the transition is happening so rapidly that the ability to shift and to move and to keep up is going to be increasingly challenging. So if we don't kind of almost want to gaze a little bit into the future and figure out what that is, we might very well find ourselves sitting with antiquated models that are just not future fit. The previous panel, um, I think the Energy Council was very clear about the fact that the pace of change is happening. It's happening anyway. The transition is happening anyway. What is in our hands, I think, is the choice as to whether that happens in a haphazard manner or we choose to bring a little bit of shape and form to it. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean the support in terms of an overarching strategy as a country, um, as to what it is that we, we think we, we need to achieve and how we need to get there. Uh, some of that talks to the reindustrialization. They're looking at new industrialization and what that needs to look like uh, to support a just transition. The explicit focus on the justice element of the transition, which has significant social consequences and, and implications. 
those are areas we would need to look at. And that overarching strategy as a country would then guide and help many of the issues and challenges which have been outlined throughout the morning. Because once you have a North Star that we know we're going towards, it's much easier then to implement the kind of policies we need, the incentives that need to be in place, and immediately we'll start alleviating the challenges we have. Because what I think is happening is that the shift is happening in pockets. And because there isn't necessarily the support mechanism to understand exactly where we're going, we're then having to constantly almost have a knee-jerk reaction. And you know, my, unfortunately for my sins, I've worked 25 years in the financial sector before coming in here. And I always go back to thinking about what we did on the back of the financial crisis in 2008. Regulatory knee-jerk reactions almost go the opposite end, over-regulation potentially. And are we in a rapid system of change where we, we might find ourselves in a similar situation in different ways in a transition, but the opportunity here is to be on the front foot of advising what that needs to look like. The skills transition that I, that I talked about, I think is one that has implication not just for South Africa, but actually across our continent. If we're going to leverage and get and actually achieve this dividend that we talk about all the time in youth that we have on the continent and a burgeoning body of youth that is growing and is really still the largest body that we will see. But in the context of, rapid, of rampant unemployment, inequality, and what is that other than a ticking time bomb if we're not going to be very deliberate about the economic architecture that's going to support the change, the development that we need, that is going to say that change is inevitable and how are we going to shift and shape that. So that is where an organization like ours really sits at that intersection of saying there's a need for being at the forefront of the thinking and how can we do some of the research that supports that. For those of you not familiar, uh, there's a really great piece of work called the Just Transition Pathways work that has been done over a few years. A massive 400 stakeholder grouping collaboration piece that really was seeking to answer the question about is net zero by 2050 possible for our economy? And if it's possible, what could that look like? and has then gone on to create some of the decarbonization pathways on extensive modeling, done um, looking at our economy, looking at the realities of South Africa and saying what does the trajectory for decarbonization look like on a number of the key sectors in the economy. So the consequences of that could, or rather application of that research comes up with clear you know, suggestions on what does that mean for policy? What does that mean for shift? What actions can be taken? And our next phase of work is really looking at what then are the low-hanging fruit? Because again, in the absence of a clear architecture and a, a direction as a country, you are finding that businesses are already facing those challenges and the changes. Uh, for those familiar with it, one of the simple one is a carbon border adjustment mechanism happening in the European Union right now that directly will have implications for our manufacturing sectors or export in there because their landed cost is going to be so much higher that it could render it completely uncompetitive. And in so doing, potentially decimate sectors in our economy. And so if we don't go those transitions, and yes, there are lots of arguments about whether that is in breach of World Trade Organization and whether that's protectionist, and that's a fight that will happen, but it's not the only place. Similar things are happening in other jurisdictions. So we're a smaller open economy. We are takers to a large extent. And so how do we shift? And that's where I think the collective brain power of all of us together that says, where's the research that tell us where this is going? What is the skill set that's required? How do we work together with business to say, what is future fit skills? One of the key areas we focus on is partnerships with TVET colleges, and we've got about 12 across the country, where we directly work in them and we create hubs for uh, understanding what skill, gets required, skill set is required. And one of the further focus we're going to have now is particularly on just energy uh, transition, so jet skills. And so how do we do that? And that's kind of the private sector saying, we want to help to take a step forward, but work together across academia, business, and all of the others. So those are some that I wanted to touch on, because I think those are areas where there's ripe for collaboration, directly touches on across business, academia, and a number of areas where we know there could be real and tangible returns on investment in the form of employment that is sustainable, not multi-year internships. And that is one that will really give us a sense of hope and give us the ability to actually compete in a future economy. Great. Thank you. That was a very, uh, very rich uh, set of points that you raised there. Um, I got a few key words, future outlook. Uh, you also alluded to the importance of embedding that future out outlook in a national sort of mm -hmm. strategy or yep. vision um, that, can, that can sort of um, 
hold policies and incentives aligned uh, uh, within the country. Mm -hmm. You also talked about the agility of the financial system and financial mechanisms. Um, those two last points speak to the next speakers. Uh, so I think that is a very um, good um, uh, entry point to, um, to ask uh, Keto Gordam, uh, the CEO of the South African SME Fund, to, particular, to reflect in general uh, on the questions that were posed at the beginning, but also maybe reflect on some of these um, uh, points around the agility of the financial system and how um, uh, uh, funding comes into this story of partnerships. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at the United States stock market today, eight of the top ten largest companies on, on the stock exchange did not exist 25 years ago. So Amazon or Facebook or Google or whoever it is were not there 25 years ago. And <clears throat> venture capital has basically changed the, the way the world looks. Almost one out of five people employed in the US today works for a company that's less than 25 years old. And I don't want to use the US as the only example, but they are, you know, the same story applies pretty much around the world. And in South Africa, we obviously are lagging, lagging in many different ways. And the one statistics that blew me away three or four years ago when I first looked at this was that the universities and science councils in South Africa between 2006 and 2014, I think the number was, had spent 40 billion rands on primary research. 40 billion rands on research. So lots of journal articles, lots of patents, 40 spin-outs came out of that whole exercise, and only a handful of those made it to anything. So if you, if you look at the cost of, of, of innovation com converting into commercialization, and I'm not saying that's the only objective, but that's certainly how we see the world, uh, then we've been a dismal failure. And so the SASME fund five years ago, when we got a pot of money from the private sector, uh, decided that we would start growing the venture capital space in, in South Africa, and that's what we've done for the last five years. Uh, today we sit uh, with just over two billion rands of capital. We've allocated most of it, not all of it, uh, to 13 different venture capital funds. By the end of the year, we'll have just over two billion in the hands of 16 different venture capital funds. And all of them sit at the intersection of three little groups. So it's either universities or science councils or smart people in the one group, coming up with ideas, entrepreneurs, people who are keen on building a business and want to get wealthy, and then venture capital fund managers who are sitting on pots of capital and want to take you know, eight or 10 bets and put somewhere between 10 and 25 million rands per business to see which one of those will grow. And over the last five years, we've seen uh, a pretty seriously positive impact. The thing we're proudest of having created over the last five years is something called the University Technology Fund. We work with all of the universities, but only five have been meaningful partners with us so far in commercializing IP coming out of universities. And to be honest, we've been way more effective than uh, you know, most people would have expected us to be in, in encouraging universities to partner with us. We've just persuaded in the last six months UCT to put 100 million from its endowment fund into our venture capital fund. Last week we had uh, Stellenbosch put 100 million rand of their capital into our venture capital fund. So clearly they believe that what we're doing as a private sector organization to leverage public IP is beginning to work. We do a very, very similar thing with about a billion rands in debt where we work with small uh, lenders that lend into the township economy businesses and I'm just going to tell you two very quick stories, and, and then I'm going to stop there. One is we lend 30,000 rands on a revolving credit basis to spousal shops. The minimum improvement we've seen in revenue is 100%. 100% improvement in revenue with a 30,000 rand six-month loan that they keep taking you know, over and over and over again. And it just tells you that you know, the absence of basic capital and a bit of business support you know, is, is a game changer. We also have the only mortgage product for backroom housing done by a company called Inlu Living, where they will build between six and 16 rooms in your backyard at their cost. It's, the payback is a five-year mortgage, and on day one, you get 10% of the income. So it's the only mortgage I've seen anywhere in the world 
where the homeowner gets 100% funding for the pro project development and gets 10% of the revenue. And so we're seeing innovation in the South African township economy. What it requires is for those three things to come together, smart people, entrepreneurs, and money. And you know, that's our core business, and we, we, I feel a little bit you know, sort of intimidated by all the, the big picture stuff here. We are a very focused small player. Uh, we had a three, three billion under management. It's a team of six people, and we do our best. Great. Can I, can I push you a little bit to reflect on, you'd mentioned the University Technology Fund yeah. as an example. Um, kind of brought me back to where we started earlier with the suggestion of the zero, um, uh, net zero technology centers. How do you see these types of initiatives sort of uh, complementing each other or suggestions? So we, we are very much against anything that is focused on supply side. So we won't say we think we're clever, we're going to go and do something. We're always going to be led by demand. Mm -hmm. We want clever mm -hmm. people to come up with ideas and we'll back them. So we, we are very different from many people sitting in this, in this room where we don't have an agenda mm -hmm. and a mission statement and we're trying to achieve things. Mm -hmm. We are responding to what smart people are coming up with. So we won't create one of those. <laughs> Any response from your side? Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm creating a little bit of... <laughs> <laughs> I, well, short answer, I mean, I think we need both supply and demand side interventions. Uh, and I, I love the work Ketz has been doing. I think it's filling a crucial gap in our innovation ecosystem. So, you know, VC funding is the... Is, 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 is the real hurdle for many of these innovations. And the <clears throat> idea behind net zero technology centers would be producing the kinds of innovations and entrepreneurs that will then go knock on yep. Ketso's door. Great. We would be waiting for them. <laughs> <laughs> right, there's, there's been several comments about um, national uh, strategy, supply, demand type of interventions. Uh, I think they speak a lot to the space of policy. So we have uh, Imran Patel, who is a public policy and strategy manager with a focus on innovation, sustainability, social and economic development at DSI. Uh, thanks, Erika, and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting and again, the good work that is being done to better understand the system. I think this, this last conversation, uh, interaction, in fact, uh, kind of reinforced the, the simple message that I wanted to kind of convey because your question was, why do we need to collaborate in the R&D space? I would say it's broader than R&D. It's kind of RDI and knowledge in a sense. And how do we do this and what kind of incentives do we, do we put in place? And, and the simple answer is that I, I think there's many reasons why we need to collaborate. Some have already been, been identified. Some of it is core to your very existence. I don't think we're gonna survive, whether it's government or industry or universities. The world is changing and we need to change with it and, and collaboration is the way in which we can survive in a, uh, with a new mandate as this world is changing. So I, I think that that's clear in a sense where there's been examples of collaborations and some of that has been mentioned. DSI has had some involvement in those projects, whether it's the Mandela Mining Precinct, the Sector Innovation Funds, you know, partnering with the South African SMME Fund, um, et cetera. Those are different types of collaborations and that's the kind of point that I want to mention. As, as, as government, we need to be focused more broad based. And the focus for the DSI is to build the innovation system. So those examples, and, and it's not gonna be one size fits all. I think there's a lot of uh, specificity and I think we need to accept uh, that, that you, you, you know, what's gonna be good for the mining sector is gonna be very different to the, to the forestry sector what's good for commercialization. So the framework I have is that we need to collaborate clearly because we have weaknesses on a number of fronts. And let me focus on those. The first front is what we, we, we are not commercializing enough, whether it's from publicly funded IP or whether it's smart people in township economies. So we have things like the grassroots innovation program. Now we're working with, with, with other government departments, et cetera. So clearly the rate 
at which we generate new business opportunities is clearly there. But it's not just uh, on commercialization. Some of it has been touched on. Second thing I think is we need to develop capabilities. And I, do, I don't like to talk about research and development because we're in a global global world. Some of the stuff you can, can get from other places. Mm -hmm. But in some ways we struggle to even integrate good technologies in our systems because we don't have the capabilities. AI is a good example of this here. Lots is happening globally. But as a system, are we strong enough, besides from pockets of excellence, to actually take advantage of technologies that exist? I mean, Christian spoke about the fact that 70% are mature technologies. Sometimes it's astounding that even on the mature technologies, we haven't effectively done that. So it's around mm -hmm. finance, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's more about technology development, deployment, and diffusion. I mean, this Bewen who's running, who's working with, with uh, the Mandela Mind Prison always says this year. So let's not just focus on technology development. I think we need to spend more on technology deployment, even on mature technologies. And that does need a collaboration because universities sometimes work with mature technologies, not always new technologies. So that's the kind of second level of collaboration. And what are the incentives there? I think it's going to be around co-funding, mainly, in, in, in the main. Um, because if you want to collaborate, you need to come in. And then the third area of collaboration, which is why I want to, to make a stand for this, because I've changed my portfolios for people who know this. So, you know, <laughs> I've, I've come to accept that you have to, as, you have to take on the portfolio that you, you ascribe for. So now my new responsibilities is to protect science, technology, and innovation, even at the basic level. So I heard a, a few uh, negative comments around publications. <laughs> so, 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 I had, so I had to add that on, because what we need to do is, is build a system at a foundational level. Some of the systems are showing that even as we drive towards commercialization, we're a small system at the southern tip of Africa. We don't have enough people. So we have to be smart about this. But one of the things we can't neglect to do is to build a system at the fundamental level. And there's been very good cases here that I've been exposed to as an example. You know, if we have partnerships in the theoretical physics space or at the fundamental physics space with uh, uh, institutions like CERN or the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in, in Dubna in, 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 in the UK, or even on the SKA. I mean, the SKA has generated a lot of, lot of IP, but the basic focus was not necessarily there. So I think we must not uh, neglect that. We need to remain as part of a balanced portfolio. Now, what is the balance? I don't know. I think that's the challenge for policymakers because sometimes we may be veering too much from one extent to another. So I think Ketsu mm -hmm. gave a very good example. 40 billion rand investment, the returns from his perspective has been low in one instance. Other people say the returns have been marginal on the knowledge side. We need that conversation if we're going to be doing a balanced portfolio. What is the ideal rate? Because we're not a big player. In the bigger scheme of things, we're not a big player. So I think the, the issue of collaboration, things like this is the starting point, that if we can all think from our, from our vantage points, whether it's the PCC or the SMME fund, drive that, make sure there's excellence in the different initiatives we to do, whether it's Mandela Mining Precinct, and, and this is where I want to conclude on around collaboration, is that you know in, in innovation studies, you have radical innovations and you have incremental innovation. I think it's the incremental approach. It's the many, many small things that are gonna add up to, I've given up on big ideas trying to change the world. We need to do many things. So where it's working in the Manila Mining Precinct Sector Innovation Fund, we need to continue. If certain things were working in the past, like THRIP, we need to go back and ask the question, what happened? And then be brave enough to be able to take up that issue. So I'm hoping with Bonani and I, the STRIP issue has come up a number of times. We're gonna to have to have that conversation with the detail, et cetera, because as part of a system, it was, it was contributing positively. So collaboration is gonna require many, many sub-collaborations, and each of those collaborations will need its own set of incentives and its own modalities for, for doing that. And I think there's no other shortcut, there's no magic bullet. Thanks.
Thank you so much, uh, Imran, for, that, uh, for those reflections. I should have mentioned Imran is the Deputy Director General of Research, Development and Support um, uh, at, the, at DSI. Um, you are reminded us of the importance of embracing diversity um, and uh, multiple, multiplicity of approaches uh, in, in how do we incentivize and support collaborations. Uh, we are going to move on to Prof. Daniels, uh, our last panelist uh, who is online. He is a professor of economics and director of the Southern Africa Labor Development and Development Policy Research Unit, SALDRU, at the University of Cape Town. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. It's a little bit low, but we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to be very specific and answer the three questions that you posed, Chair, which I've got uh, down as why is R&D so relevant but so difficult? What incentives can be put in place to ensure RDI collaboration can take place? And which incentives can be implemented or changed? So just on the first one, why is R&D so difficult? I think this is where um, the HSRC's RNGI survey, which has been released today, has been very useful in looking at the broader questions. Um, and I'd like to focus not just on like uh, innovation per se, but the different types of innovation. So you know, we usually talk about new to firm innovations, new to market innovations, and new to the world in the, uh, innovations. But what we often don't uh, focus on is imitation. Right, so there's a pathway to innovation which is based on imitation first. And this is where workers have historically been extremely useful inside of firms. Because workers are working on the production line in the farms and they are the human capital that embeds uh, within the firm. So sometimes developing countries have to imitate first before they can innovate. Um, and this is really important to get into the RDI surveys because um, we also come from a historical background of very low levels of trust between workers and management in South Africa. Okay, so another question I'd like to see in the RDI survey of the HSRC is a Likert scale question saying how much do you trust workers and asking the workers how much do you trust management? Because if there's no trust, there's not going to be collaboration inside of the firm. And I think it's very important for South Africa to start actually measuring trust and tracking how this changes over time. Assuming the HSRC continues to conduct the survey for the next 20 years, we can see the evolution of trust within firms and we can see questions on imitation leading to innovation. And those are all important steps on the, on the uh, ladder towards building and developing new to the world innovations. But we have to start by imitating first, right? China did it before that. Japan did it, and it's part of the ecosystem of getting to where we need to be. The second question I'm going to talk about is what incentives can be put in place to ensure that RDI collaboration can take place? Now, we often talk a lot about public-private partnerships. What we need to start talking about is worker management partnerships. And this means labor inside of the firms, right, collaborating with management inside of the firms. Now, I was very lucky to be part of a manufacturing company that was initially started or at least partly incentivized by trip funds in the 2013-2014 time uh, to set up a factory. This was a manufacturing uh, company that was designed to sort of promote the circular economy It was working with recycled rubber. And we got the Workplace Challenge Program that was at the time linked to productivity essay we got support from that Workplace Challenge Program, and then we also got support from the Gauteng Tooling Initiative. This is 2015, 2016, right? And what was fantastic about the collaboration between the Productivity Essays Workplace Challenge and the Gauteng Tooling Initiative was that the Gauteng Tooling Initiative could benchmark our levels of productivity to international best practice, and then they could see where we were at, and then they could build inside the factory with like all of our staff, including management and workers, they could build a map to get us from where we started to where we ultimately wanted to be, including how to get to ISO 9001 certified uh, world-class management practices standards, right? 
So South Africa does have a history of successful public-private partnerships and successful worker management partnerships through state-funded support to bring workers and management together and to bring the public and private sector together. The last question that I want to address is which incentives can be implemented or changed? First, as Imran, uh, Imran has just said, reform trip, please guys, the new regulations don't work. As we saw in the previous session, nobody wants to apply for it. It's so onerous that both business and research and, and, uh, and everybody else involved think that the compliance costs are too high and not worth it, right? I've looked very, very carefully at uh, the sector innovation funds and they don't replicate what TRIP used to do. They don't do the same thing. So Imran, we can chat more about this. The second thing I'd like to talk about is also the link to scale up. Once you have these successful firms and you've got the sort of initial momentum going, you've got good worker management, participation, you've got good public-private partnerships, there must be the link to angel investors and, and to venture capital, right? So this is where Ketso is doing fantastic work, and I'd like to encourage that also as the last part of my um, input. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, very, very um, uh, valuable insights, and I think it rounds everything up uh, together. We have, um, th there are nice connections uh, mm. between the, the, the interventions, I think, from all the panelists that, that are coming up. Um, but I am also very mindful of time and lunch. Uh, do we have 10 minutes, five minutes for questions? 10, lovely, okay, great. So let's, let's take um, a few questions from new voices in the room. Uh, <laughs> preferably, let's start with some female voices, if we can. No bias here. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll come back to the panelists, and, and if, you, if you can, in your final reflections or, que or answers, reflect on some of these bridges mm -hmm. that already started uh, forming up. That would be great. Any... We have one here, but it, it, uh, is this the first question you ask? <coughs> okay, great. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, th th did you also have a question? Sure, okay, okay. okay. Okay, no, thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, Teslim Yusuf from Senedi. Senedi is South African National Energy Development Institute. I wanted to ask um, the, the doctor from the um, University of South Africa, how involved are you with the CETAS, the Sector Educational Training Institutions? Mm -hmm. I think there's a connection, a massive connection there. Mm -hmm. And then I think to the gentleman on the extreme, you, you really triggered a lot of thinking in me. And I want to see, is your model documented? What you, what you talked about, is it properly documented? Is this something we could, we could build upon and try it in other areas? because it looks very practical, and I think we need to explore it. Thank you. Great, thanks for those questions. It would be great to get another, another question if people are not too hungry. <laughs> okay, let's take yours. While the ladies think. Um, I think mine will be, <laughs> thanks, thanks. I think mine will be directed to uh, Imran, also linking to the previous con con conversation. I think perhaps there is value on mapping out the linkage from basic research, applied research, experimental research. I know Glenda and Tim do touch on that in terms of how the investments look like. But in terms of how this lead to innovation performance, economic development, I know it's not, a, it's not always one-to-one, -one, but perhaps there's, a, there's value in how we map out those aspects so that everyone understands why as part of the portfolio, basic research is important, why applied research is important, and how all these things supposedly link up to what we're trying to achieve at the end. Because if we make decisions to crush the other because of one stakeholder, then you end up harming the system that you are saying we actually need to be focusing on putting together from the base. So I don't know what your comment is on that, uh, Imran. Great. Let's uh, take this round. Um, the way directed at specific people. I think the first one was uh, for, for uh, yeah. oh, it was for uh, Dr. Matutu. Thank, thank you very much for the question. Um, 
the largest contribution by the CITES to higher education institutions has been on um, uh, capacity development. I'm talking about now bursaries, um, uh, student debt, and so on. But uh, they're focused largely on their uh, sectors. So if we're talking about banking, they would focus on that, or services, they would focus on that. And then, uh, and then there is the ETDP CETA, which looks broadly at uh, everything. So it has largely been that. But within then um, the higher education and university sector, when they look at their sector skills plans and the deficiencies and all of that, uh, because we as universities of South Africa have got the various groupings of uh, communities of practice, whether we're talking about finance executives, whether we're talking about HR practitioners and so on, so they use these groupings to facilitate the necessary gaps in terms of training. Uh, so uh, there is that uh, element of the practical tra training as in you know the the skills which are required in that in that sense, and others will look at security officers being trained uh, for managing uh, crowds, you know that kind of thing. So that will be a security as a sector uh, trying to get uh, universities to be much more responsive uh, based on the kind of unrest that we encounter. As, as, as higher education. So that's broadly uh, our involvement with the, the, the sitters right now. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, the next one is for you. Can the model be um, I'm, documented? I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got an opportunity to answer a question because there was a major omission in my earlier <laughs> contribution, which is that over the last four years, we have partnered with the DSI in the Innovation Fund. And it's been an incredibly successful public-private partnership collaboration. In the 1.3 billion rand venture capital fund we've just raised, 250 million comes from the DSI. But we've geared that money four times from the private sector. So instead of government allocating 250 and spending it, through us they get to spend 1.3 billion, which gives you a much higher return on, on, on investment. We are about to launch a second collaboration, which is on a seed fund, which is to do much smaller venture capital deals, sort of the one to five million rand type uh, uh, investments that are still early stage ideas that are not yet profitable, or not yet making money, but are very clever. And so we're going to be doing that over the next uh, year or two. And the last area of collaboration is training 30 new black young professionals to get into the venture capital space. Because like in everything in South Africa, the diversity issue remains a problem both from a race and a gender point of view. So we're collaborating uh, with the department to, again, it's a, it's a public-private partnership. So some of the money comes from government, quite a bit of the money comes from the private sector uh, to be able to do those things. And the short answer to the question is very well documented on our website. Uh, the innovation fund of, of the DSI is also uh, pretty well documented, not just in relation to the work we do, but the rest of the work in the ecosystem. And again, TIA, which is a DSI entity, uh, has also recorded quite a bit of the work that it's done over the last, I think, 10 or 11 years now. So there's a lot of information, rich information available around venture capital. We are a sort of growing industry. It's becoming a more recognized asset class. The day pension fund money goes into venture capital, you know you have success and we've just got the first billion of pension fund money in. So I think we've broken the back of it and it's going to become a much bigger story over the next five to ten years. Thank you. Great. And I think the last question was, uh, was for you, Imran. You can. <laughs> because I, would, I would just reference other comments. So, so the short answer is yes, we need to be uh, doing... I wouldn't call it mapping. I think we need to build our strategic intelligence. So certain things like the R&D survey is an established uh, methodology. You have to follow the Frascati manual because these are comparative figures. But I don't think we have, even though we, we punt things like AI and big data, I don't think we've done it for the innovation system. 
So hopefully we're moving in that direction now. There's been a lot more discussions in the DSI, whether you look at the NRF, the TS databases, etc. We don't have a helicopter view of all of those, those, those developments. And I think quick and dirty methods to harvest that information will start giving us strategic intelligence while we have to do the, the kind of rigorous, uh, very uh, costly um, kind of surveys that, that, that we have to do as part of our, our national statistics. So I think that's part of it. It's really, uh, I, I think, you know, linked to what, what uh, Reza talked about in terms of, uh, of, of um, 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 some of the kind of um, um, funds and statistics and whatever. We don't have a good sense of uh, trust, this question of trust. We actually have to build trust across the system. And you can't build trust without actually being involved in the project. So I think we've done this as the DSI. We have some examples. We have some learnings. These are not easier processes. Uh, the colleagues will tell you you've had very tough discussions and engagements. But eventually, over time, you build up that. So I agree that, uh, that those softer factors are very important that we're going to have to do. I will pick up with Reza around SIFs and THRIP, et cetera. They were meant to be different deliberately. Um, uh, it was part of, of our motivation for the SIFs, so we would be able to deal with that. But I think, <clears throat> in a sense, my concluding comments are that every panel that I serve on here uh, kind of either reinforces we are working with PCC and others, but they kind of give you new insights and and there's no shortcut mm -hmm. but to continue conversations outside of panels. And these linkages, I think, for me, uh, as Dan mentioned in, the, in his opening comments, they are, the trend line is positive, even if we don't see it individually. I think we are moving towards greater cooperation, uh, a lot more acknowledgement of the importance of science, technology, and innovation, etc. Uh, and, and these are filtering, and we just have to continue pursuing it, whether we're in Senedi or in, in the HSRC, et cetera. Yeah, so those are the comments. A lot of useful things. I will pick up with some of the colleagues outside of this panel. Thanks. Great. Um, I think we are I'm returning the microphone here <laughs> <laughs> as a sign of closure of this, of this uh, session. It's been great. Maybe, Sorry? Erica, just one is... Okay, great. I thought um, I was being signaled. Yeah. Just, just, just maybe... <laughs> okay, I would, what I would do is I, would, I, I wanted to ask, uh, everybody here came with an experience, with uh, ideas on how this collaboration happens, how it should be incentivized. I'd like to ask you in 10, 15 words to say what is the new um, takeaway that you gather after listening to everybody. This is a multi-stakeholder panel. Um, and I'm sure it triggers something, uh, some thinking uh, that you will take with you. So if you can summarize in 10, 15 words, what is your, your new takeaway? Well, I, I was particularly taken with Reza's input about involving workers in some of these partnerships. And we've just put out a set of recommendations on the social ownership of renewable energy which is looking at models for community and worker ownership. And, you know, just to underline the point, I mean, a lot of the big coal mining companies have been taking uh, their profits and putting them into new renewable energy ventures. I mean, I think of uh, Exaro, Sariti, um, and they're, you know, they're becoming diversified energy companies, not just coal miners. And it would be crazy for workers to be left out of this trend. And workers come to the party with a number of resources, including, you know, they're sitting on huge pension funds, there's the mine workers' pension fund, etc. So it's not like they're capital deprived in, in coming into the game. So it would be really good to see a number of worker, private sector uh, collaborations in the technology and innovation space. Great. Okay. Um, we'll, yes. Thank Let's you, Dr. Shamila. Thank you. Do I have time to quickly touch on a working version of something that really is leveraging R&D and um, looking at social inclusion and social economic growth? 
Um, it's a pilot that we, we're looking at in the Atlantis SEZ. So one of the issues we know is that we can definitely scale private sector RTI through your sectoral agreements between business and government. And one of our models is something called installation repair maintenance that we're doing, so that's looking at technical skills. And we're busy working and piloting within the Atlantis so, uh, Special Economic Zone at the moment, and that's about localizing the renewable energy value chain. So the localization opportunity you know, is really trying to say, what can we do? We know we have limited VC, we've got limited private equity. How can we scale localization of known proven technologies like those within renewables? In that case, I mean, we localize as a key opportunity again for women, for SMMEs, black owned businesses to benefit across that value chain. And so that's the opportunity to be deliberate in supporting inclusive economic growth. Um, that example that I talked about is where the private sector is investing in growing green manufacturing, um, but with certain incentives provided at the national level through by DTIC, in fact and uh, through the, South, the special economic zone process, and then you've got further local government support from the city of Cape Town as well. And that's a good example, I think. So they're using local contractors, labor wherever possible in the work, um, including existing signed contracts, um, and it's definitely helping to render that RDI space more inclusive and responsive to local needs. So I think that one was a good one there. And they're also pursuing what you call that living lab approach. So this SEZ itself is strong sustainability and social inclusion targets, which we know are critical and we've got to be deliberate about. And it's allowing space for innovation and that is in collaboration with the private sector. Mm -hmm. So there you're looking at national government, local government incentives coming together with private sector in a space that can do that. Um, and one of, and we're actually going to be building one of our IRM hubs in there to do this explicitly. And the good news, I think, is that that inclusive growth model is definitely not limited to Atlantis. Mm -hmm. That is something that is easily now replicable and scalable. And this is a big test case in one area because that enabling environment is a lot more conducive at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Dr. Mututu. I think. Uh, Very short. For uh, me, mic, I think uh, the key takeaway are the people who are here. Um, they have uh, uh, enabled me to look broader at some of the work that we do. And certainly in future, I'll be able to knock on their doors, be it for speakers, be it for collaborations, <laughs> be it for collaborations, be it uh, for uh, whatever projects that we're running. Thanks. Great. <laughs> takeaway for me is that I'm listening to the key challenges around being able to do the tech there for innovation and, and you know the trip and the other projects pro, uh, sort of initiatives haven't worked really well then there's also the challenge of scaling businesses where the technology is once <coughs> proven needs to be then taken to the next level and I think the answer lies in this new thing that's sort of taking over the world from a financing point of view called blended finance and if we can just layer free capital with returnable capital, with cheap capital, with expensive capital, put it in a single structure, give different investor bases what they're looking for. We've done a little bit of this with the township economy in South Africa at a very small scale with a 300 million rand fund, and it's been amazing to see the, the impact of that. And I think that in the DSI internal discussions, uh, in looking at what the answer to the scaling and, and tech dev problem might be, I think the answer is, is some form of blended finance structure. Thank you. Uh, lastly, Prof. Daniels. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I think I've got to, uh, I'm very happy to hear that the, the thrift regulations might uh, have a possibility of review. I think they once were very <laughs> successful. And then secondly, I agree um, completely on the question of blended finance that Feto has uh, mentioned. I do think scale-up is one of the toughest things to do once innovations are successful. Um, we've seen some examples of ecosystems being built in places like Stellenbosch that have been really supportive of this kind of thing. It's great to see initiatives at a national level, and it's a strong takeaway for me. Thanks, Chair. Thank you so much. I think we are uh, concluding this, this panel. There's been a very rich discussion. I won't try to summarize, because I will be standing between you and lunch.